Good evening. Welcome to our seminar series, Understanding What? World Events. And tonight's topic is on the brink of World War III. Now, this is quite a big topic, so I hope you have your seat belts ready. We're going to go on a journey, and this is really a huge journey. And so, as we start tonight, we have said and seen in Scripture that God, just before Jesus comes, sends a last warning message to this planet, symbolized by three angels flying to this world. And this message entails the following. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people." saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. And do what? Worship Him. Tonight we're going to look at this section. Worship Him that made what? Heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Let me just quickly throw this out there now before we get started. Who made everything? God. Okay, so who is in control of creation and this earth? God. So a lot of people are worried that we are going to get uh, to the point where we rid ourselves from this world or we, we destroy the world. Who's in control of this world? God, the creator. And it is him who we should worship. Now when we talk about war, it is quite something else. But I want to take it to a next level tonight. War reveals the what? the heart. You see, when we go deeper, war is raging because there is war in our what? In our hearts. Now, just a bit of background. You know, I, I assume you were here last night. There's a war in our hearts because we are captured on a planet hijacked by Satan, and we find ourselves amid a cosmic battle between good and evil. Wars fought through the ages is a result of this cosmic battle. Sin and evil in the heart causes a spirit of war and flows out in actual warfare. Now, if we take this a step further, this cosmic war fought around and in our hearts is a war for our soul, for our love, and for our what? Our worship. So I can basically conclude war is about worship. This is very important, and we will see this tonight. Now, when we go to the website, uh, statista.com, it says the world at war in 2022. And there you can see all the countries in red that are at this very given moment in conflict. 27 countries. It's a lot. There's war globally going on. Now, to set the stage tonight, I want to take you to this National Intelligence Estimate on Climate Change. This is from the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. They brought out a document last year. Here is the front cover of the document. It says, climate change and international responses increasing challenges to U.S. national security through 2040. Now, I hope you can see there on the screen. If not, I will read it to you. Here at the left side, it says, risk, geopolitical tensions over climate responses. And then they put this in a graph. Uh, at the top, they explain it. There is none, low, medium, and high. And here you can see it in the next section, how from last year going all the way to 2040, they predict that there will be more tension worldwide, globally, because of climate change, and how people, they say, resist the climate change or their perception of climate change, or competition, or contention. Now, the BBC wrote a piece about this document stating climate change will bring global tension, U.S. intelligence report says. Now, please note the following sentences. Climate change will lead to growing international tensions, the U.S. intelligence community has warned, in a bleak assessment. And then they say at the bottom, the report paints a picture of a world failing to cooperate, leading to dangerous competition and instability. And so they say in their move to go to zero emissions globally, there will be more conflict than ever before. So according to the U.S. intelligence, are we going to have better days ahead of us or worse days? They say it themselves. The outlook is bleak. It's dangerous and it's unstable. Now, 
World War III has been declared, Pope Francis says, and many people agree with him. Bill Ackman says Russia's attack on Ukraine means World War III has likely already started. And just this past week, Pope Francis repeats the warning of World War III. And then some people ask this question, could there be war between Russia and the West? Can it spill over to Europe? What will happen next? The growing fear of a wider war between Russia and the West is a reality. Euronews says Ukraine war. How has Russia's invasion changed Europe? It changed it dramatically. All the supplies are basically cut off in energy-wise. Europe, a long, dark winter looms ahead. And people's gas are being cut off. Coal is being cut off. Uh, propane is being cut off. Bloomberg says keeping the lights on in Europe will be very hard this winter. And in many countries in Europe, they are gathering at this very moment firewood for the winter, especially in Germany, because they have no guarantees of what is lying ahead. And it looks like it may spill over into Europe. Europe looks ahead anxiously to a winter of energy rationing. The EU is now in the red zone. Now, here's the official website of the European Union, one of the websites. They state the future of Europe is being defined when? Now. We're going to look at Europe in a bit out of Bible prophecy. Now, here is Joseph Borrell saying on their own website at the EU, with the invasion of Ukraine, we witness the return of war and tragedy on European soil. We need to be more than a soft power and enhance our instruments to deter reckless adversaries. And so they say we should ready ourselves for war. And so all over you hear this in Europe. Europe must prepare for war. And the people are preparing on the ground level. Now here is an expert warning. Putin to attend war games with China and other allied nations. Expert warns of a dangerous time. Now, when we look at the army of Russia, they've not even used half of their army in the fight with Ukraine. Just a few soldiers, some tanks, some military equipment. Not, we have no idea how big their army I is. Now, throw into the mix, Russia is not the only threat to world peace. The biggest other power is that of China. Here's the 90th celebration of the army. It was an impressive display of China's growing military might, but also its growing sophistication. Much of the hardware was being put on show for the first time, including new stealth fighters. Another first, Xi Jinping appearing in army battle dress. A reminder that he is not only the country's president, but also the head of its armed forces. At the end of his first five years in office, he has cemented his hold on power. And this was a timely reminder to friends and rivals alike who's in charge. As China repeats its call for all sides to show restraint to avoid conflict, this display on the rolling plains of Inner Mongolia also sent a message that increasingly China has military options of its own. Now they say Danger Zone author warns of growing tension between China and the US. War with China. It sounds unthinkable, but according to many experts, the countdown may be on. China's President Xi Jinping is shaping up to the West like never before. And just last week, a major new military alliance was announced between the US, Australia and the UK to counter Chinese aggression in the Pacific. The first major initiative of AUKUS will be to deliver a nuclear-powered submarine fleet for Australia. 
America and its allies are preparing for a battle we didn't think was possible. The idea that China would never attack, even never invade, well, I wouldn't count on that. Xi Jinping is already on a collision course with his own people. From recently outlawing boy bands to enforcing propaganda lessons in primary schools. Xi Jinping is taking control and he's prepared to fight for it even beyond his homeland. If this unimaginable conflict were to happen, it would begin with an invasion of Taiwan, the tiny nation off its coast that China has long believed is theirs. Once they make the decision to do this, they will come full bore like a crazy man with an ax. Control of Taiwan would give China a huge new military reach over the Pacific. Will US-China tensions boil over? Will this tension boil over? What do they say? Now they say the Taiwan issue is purely China's internal affair. Here's their official person stating this. The Taiwan issue is purely China's internal affair, which won't stand for any foreign interference. Issues bearing on China's core interests, including the sovereignty and territorial integrity, there's no room for compromise or concession. No one should underestimate the Chinese people's firm resolution, will and capability to defend its national sovereignty and territorial and should not stand against the 1.4 billion Chinese people. Now, Pelosi went to Taiwan to visit there and this infuriated China and they sent this warning when this happened. This is an out and out farce. The United States is violating China's sovereignty under the guise of so-called democracy. Those who play with fire will not come to a good end, and those who offend China will be punished. Shortly after Pelosi's arrival, China announced a series of live-fire military drills in the air and sea around the island. Taiwan has condemned the military. So now, not when only... When Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of America's House of Representatives, visited Taiwan, China flexed its military muscles. There's a, a real collapse in trust, and it's a really dangerous moment. Not only is one visiting Taiwan, it is poking China, and there's now a breaking of this trust even furthermore to the extent where what is going to happen next? And then U.S. lawmakers go to Taiwan and the tension with China is even doubling than before. Then China sanctions Taiwan officials and stages new military drills after U.S. lawmakers to pay visit. And then Japan comes in because they are staying there in between all of this and warning of a rising global tension. Why? Because Russia-China arms ties. It says Japan has warned in an annual defense paper of escalating national security threats stemming from Russia's war in Ukraine and China's tensions with Taiwan. The latest news from Europe has the world on edge. And here we see this all over. There's all this tension brewing, and they are describing this in great words. The world is on what? On edge. This is just, you can see this all over. The world on edge. Peace seems out of reach. The United Nations warns we are on the edge of an abyss. And in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, they say we are 100 seconds to midnight. On their website, they say the clock remains the closest it has ever been to civilization-ending apocalypse because the world remains stuck in an extremely dangerous moment. Now, this think tank, BCA Research, they have forecasted many events, you know, to the point. They are stating on their website, rising risk of a what? A nuclear apocalypse. And at the bottom they conclude the risk of Armageddon has risen dramatically. And now Russia says the West arming Ukraine will cause global collapse in chilling warning and they are, will be forced to use nuclear weapons. Here's one of the spokespeople for Putin warning the UK that we will completely wipe it from the map. The island is so small that one Sarmat missile is enough to drown it once and for all. Russian missile Sarmat, the world's most powerful, is capable of destroying an area size of Texas or England. 
a single launch Boris, Boris, and there's no Anglia England anymore. Нет. Once and for all. Why do they play games? Another option to plunge Britain into the depths of the sea is the Russian underwater robotic drone Poseidon. It approaches the target at a one kilometer depth with a speed of 200 kilometers per hour. There's no way to stop this underwater drone. It has a warhead with a capacity of up to 100 megatons. The explosion of this thermonuclear torpedo close to Britain's shores will raise a giant wave, wave, a tsunami up to 500 meters. This tidal wave is also a carrier of extremely high doses of radiation. Surging over Britain, it will turn what is probably left of them into a radioactive desert. Permanently unusable for anything. That is quite a stern warning. You can't believe that people will state these things, that they will do these things, but this is where we are at in Earth's history, where countries are threatening one another, not just with war, but with complete annihilation, total wiping out of society as we know it. Now, on this website of the Federation of American Scientists, they have this graph of the nuclear powers in the world. You can see there the United States have... 5,428 nuclear heads, and then Russia, 5,977. And there's all the rest of the countries far behind them. This is quite an ordeal. There you can see them in another graph. This question is asked on the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. Why is America getting a new 100 billion nuclear weapon? Now, I'm going to read this to you. Just listen to this. America's building a new weapon of mass destruction. A nuclear missile the length of a bowling lane. It will be able to travel some 6,000 miles, carrying a warhead more than 20 times more powerful than the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima. It will be able to kill hundreds of thousands of people in a single shot. The U.S. Air Force plans to order more than 600 of them. It's, it's insane. It's incredible. You can't think what is going on in the world 20 times more powerful than that of Hiroshima. Now, that is why the business is booming with what? Dollar doomsday bunkers. People are ordering it in the hundreds and business are skyrocketing because people are afraid. If you have $40,000, you can order yourself a bunker and have it installed. You think, oh no, that is ridiculous. Let me take you back to what happened in Hiroshima. It is no chance. So, I have a question. What? can be in someone's heart to threaten with nuclear war. Can you just imagine what is in the heart, what is in the mind? Now, a question that many people have been asking is, what would happen if all the nuclear bombs were detonated? They say there would be some people surviving on this world, but the huge volume of debris injected into the atmosphere would have far more widespread effects. The aerosol of particles would reduce the amount of heat reaching the surface from the sun, producing a so-called nuclear winter with huge environmental impact. The nuclear explosion would also unleash a pulse of electric magnetic energy that would wreck everything from national power grids to microchips around the world, and the world will be back in the Stone Age, in an ice age, and life would be very hard for those who do survive. Question, will this happen? Will this happen? What does the Bible say about this? You see, when we look at the Bible, the Bible, first of all, confirms to us, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Do we need a more sure word of prophecy in these times? Absolutely. We need certainty. When the world is so uncertain as it is at the moment, we need certainty. And the Bible says this word gives it to us, the prophetic word. We have also a more sure word of prophecy where unto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day star arise in your hearts. Question, what do we need in our hearts? Jesus. What is at the moment in most people's hearts? War, anger, bitterness, hatred, evil. Now, we need to know that the Bible predicted Revelation 11, 18, our time where we are living right now. The Bible says, and the nations were angry. Question, are the nations angry tonight? Yes. And thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, listen now, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. Do we have the capability to destroy the earth? 
Yes, we are living right there now. And God says, I'm going to intervene to destroy those who will or want to destroy the earth. Ah, oh, who's going to intervene? God. This is Bible prophecy. And so Jesus prophesied. Many people ask me, you know, will we have World War Three? The chances are good. The chances are good. If it's not this year, very soon. We are going to see war like we've never seen it before. You shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, for nations shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And Jesus, in his whole prophecy in Matthew 24, says this will be like labor pains. Are labor pains decreasing or increasing before the baby is born? Ah, so this is going to increase just before Christ comes back to this earth. So I want to ask you this question. Will we destroy ourselves? We need to go back to an ancient prophecy. An ancient prophecy in Scripture found in Daniel chapter 2. Let's look at this in perspective and see God's plan and God's promise. And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled, and his sleep broke from him. Then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syria, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me. If you will not make known unto me the dream, with the interpretation thereof, you shall be cut in pieces. But if you show the dream and the interpretation thereof, you shall receive of me gifts and rewards. They answered again and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation of it. The king answered, If you will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you, for you have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me. The Chaldeans answered before the king and said, There is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. There is none other that can show it before the king except the gods. For this cause the king was angry very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain. And they saw Daniel and his fellows to be slain. Then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Arioch the captain of the king's guard which was gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, Why is the decree so hasty from the king? Then Arioch made the thing known to Daniel. Then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time, that he would show the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house, and made the thing known to Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning the secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus unto him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah that will make known unto the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the what days? 
the latter days, thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, the great image, this great image whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image head was of fine gold, his breast and arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. What an incredible picture. What an incredible, incredible image just displaying there in the very palace of the king of the world. He is the global leader of the world, the leader of Babylon. And there in his palace, he not only has this dream, but God reveals the same dream to Daniel. Daniel comes to him and explains this to him. Now in this dream, we're going to see that there's four main metals and every metal represent a kingdom in time and that will take us through to the latter days when Jesus Christ will return to this world. Now let's go back to Daniel as he's standing before the king. Daniel 2.36 says, this is the dream and we will tell the interpretation therefore before the king. Here is a prophet. He was a slave out of Jerusalem, but he was raised to one of the main people in the government because God was with him. He was a prophet, still a young man, and here he's standing before the king of the world, and he's saying, this dream has a meaning. It is a prophecy. Now he's explaining the prophecy. Thou, o king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a what? A kingdom, okay? So these are kingdoms. Power and strength and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand and hath made thee ruler over them all. Listen now. Thou art this what? This head of gold. So this head of gold that we see there in this image is representing what? The kingdom of Babylon. So Babylon symbolized by the head of gold. This is what Daniel is telling the king. Oh, wow, what an amazing prophecy. You see, when we look at, at history, the, the Encyclopedia Britannica confirms to us in this time, Babylon was ruling the world. They were the world empire. And they believed none else will come after us. We're going to rule forever. You know, it's almost like Hitler believed we're going to rule for a thousand years and more. And no one will be able to conquer us. And here's the prophet stating, yes, you are a world empire, uh, actually designated by God. Another dictionary tells us, a history dictionary, under the rule of King Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon became one of the most incredible cities of the ancient world. They ruled the world at that time. They had one of the seven wonders in the ancient world in their city, their hanging gardens. And even to this day, they have no idea how they irrigated the, the, the plants far on top there. Even scientists today can't figure it out, figure it out how they did it back then. And the, the map where they ruled expanded to include hundreds and hundreds of square uh, um, miles all over the known world of that time. They were a huge empire. But before we continue with the prophecy, I need to interject something. Because there's something else we need to see in this sequence of kingdoms through time. You see, through time, Satan has used tyrannical empires to promote false religion and false gods. Don't miss next week where we're going to see how Satan will want to do this once again. As a full-on attack on God and His truth, to deceive and destroy his aim being still the same as when he rebelled in heaven. You remember last night what we studied? Exact same still motive in his heart. The same plan in his mind to establish his throne, rule, and law in this world in opposition to God. Everything to him is about false worship. Directing worship from God to himself as a God. Can you see this? 
Ah, oh, so now I know where war comes in. So back to Babylon. Babylon had a system of false worship. They had a false religion that lulled people into believing that by their works they can make sure that they would live forever amongst these gods, through these gods. Their main god was Marduk that promised them conquering and victory if they sacrificed to him. But who was actually behind all of this? Satan. Satan. Now back to the prophecy. Daniel continues telling the king. Now this is very, uh, very radical. He's standing. He can lose his head for what he's going to tell the king. The king believes uh, Babylon will reign forever. And he tells the king unemphatically, after thee shall arise a what? Another kingdom inferior to thee. He had to include that. But another kingdom. And so here was another kingdom. I was like, now the king's mind is thinking, Really? Another kingdom? And he's explaining to the king. We know today Medo-Persia is symbolized by the arms and chest of silver. That silver part of the image is the next kingdom. And that, according to history, was Medo-Persia. Dictionaries confirm it to us. And we read in another dictionary, Cyrus led the United Medes and Persians to greater heights. He conquered Lydia and Asia, Minor, and prospered as far as Central Asia. And finally, in 539 B.C., Cyrus marched victoriously into the ancient city of Babylon, and they became the next world empire. Wow. Now, today in archaeology, we have discovered this Cyrus cylinder. And you can read all about this in history, in archaeology. It's just incredible. Now, Guess what? God had a prophecy about Cyrus more than a hundred years before his reign. God predicted through the prophet Isaiah, Thus says the Lord to his anointed to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him, and I will lose the loins of kings, listen now, to open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. Guess what? When they marched on Babylon, guess what they found there in Babylon? Open gates. The soldiers were drunk. They had a big feast. And they marched right through the open gates exactly as God prophesied it through his prophet Isaiah. And so they extended their reign more further than that of Babylon, as you can see. Now it was many, many square miles more than Babylon, actually more than double. Media Persia was also steeped in false religion. Their main god was Ahura Mazda, and they had to make sacrifices in a very specific way, and it was a very false, deep, dark religion, but not that as the same as Babylon. Then we come to the next part of the prophecy. Daniel is standing before the king, and he says, and another third kingdom of what? Of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. Was that fulfilled? Absolutely. You see, these thighs of brass, Greece is symbolized by the thighs of brass. And he should tell us the next empire on the scene is who? Greece with Alexander the Great. In 331 BC, the Persian king Darius III was conquered by the army of the Macedonian ruler Alexander the Great at the Battle of Guagamela. In October, Babylon was taken, which means this city of Babylon so the empire of Medo-Persia was taken by Alexander the Great. And his whole goal was to rule the world. His whole goal was to conquer. And when he came to the age of 31, he cried. He said, there was, there's no more lands for me to conquer. And you can just see how he extended the rule of Greece throughout the, the then known world to thousands of of square miles. It's just incredible. But Greece also themselves were steeped in false religions. Uh, their main god was Zeus. They had uh, many, many, many gods, infighting between the gods, and the whole aim for you was to keep the gods happy. You, le you lived in constant fear. Of course, Satan was happy about it. Then the next part of the prophecy is the iron legs. Here Daniel is standing before the king and he's stating, and the fourth kingdom. Now Nebuchadnezzar is in shock. What? Second kingdom, third kingdom, fourth kingdom? You know, replacing me and my kingdom? 
Yes, Daniel is saying, The fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. For as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And we know by history, Rome is symbolized by the legs of iron. We see this in many historical instances. For instance, history tells us in popular history, the year 476 is generally accepted as the end of the Western Roman Empire, and they ruled almost for a thousand years from Greece, the end of Greece, towards their just total disintegration in 476. And I'll get to that in a moment. And what we see here is that they were an iron kingdom, a brutal, brutal kingdom, killing with iron swords and spears. And they even extended the kingdom further than just that of Greece. Their empire stretched all over modern-day Europe and further into the Middle East, into all over Africa, a huge portion of the then-known world. And they reigned but they were steeped in false religion. Their main god was Jupiter. They had a lot of other gods too. They adopted some of the Greek gods, but to them it was all about appeasing the gods in such a way that they could conquer further the world. But they wouldn't stand. You see, these legs are ending, and then there's only feet left. What happens with the feet? Daniel explains this to the king. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But they shall be in it of the strength of the iron. For as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, and as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Can you mix the two in the natural state? No. Today you can if you, if you, if you make it fine, then it's cement. But in its natural state, you cannot do it. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. What is this? We know by history that Rome was divided in divided Europe as we know it today. And so divided Europe is symbolized by the feet and toes of clay and iron, some stronger than others. And throughout history, there was conquerors and rulers and kings that tried to unify Europe. Charles V, Charlemagne, Napoleon, we can go throughout history. Hitler, he said, one people, one empire, one leader. Today, we have the European Union, many voices, one people. And their building is even in the same structure as the Tower of Babel. Just incredible. Now, World Economic Forum leader Klaus Schwab said a single digital market in Europe would boost GDP by at least 4%. This opportunity cannot be ignored. He says we should be more one than ever before. Let go of all your currencies. Let's just have one currency. And he wants to make it a digital currency. Then he says in this pandemic time, the more nationalism and isolationism pervade the global polity, the greater the chance that global governance loses its relevance and becomes ineffective. Whether it's pandemics, climate change, terrorism, or international trade, all are global issues that we can only address and whose risks can only be mitigated in a what? Collective fashion. So we need to be united. Ah, oh, but what did the prophecy say? Will they be able to unite? You see, when they were divided, Rome was divided into mainly ten parts. The Anglo-Saxons, Franks, Alemanni, Lombards, Ostrogoths, Heruli, Vandals, Burgundians, Visigoths, and Suvi. And today we know it as modern Europe as we know it. I want to share with you a quote out of this book. This is an amazing book, A Thousand Shall Fall, written about the life of Frank Hazel. He was a soldier in the Nazi army in Germany. He was forced to be part of the war. Now he said, I will not shoot. And he made himself a gun out of wood. No one knew. He, he was all the time carrying a wooden gun. He said, I will not shoot anyone. I will not listen to my commander. But he was very respectful. He, they, he was basically an engineer. He built bridges, etc. But he, here's his family, his young family, just before the war started. He carried in his pocket this very prophecy of Daniel 2 to remind him about perspective. Because everyone was like in a cult believing we're going to have a thousand-year Reich by our leader, the Führer. 
Now I want to share with you the story. Franz now pulled out the worn postcard that he had carried in his wallet since 1921 when he had been baptized as a convert from Catholicism. On the card's front was a picture of the image described in Daniel 2, and on the back, Franz had carefully typed the dates and events corresponding to each part of the image. He carefully went through the chapter verse by verse discussing the empires of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. After three and a half hours, he turned to Hauptmann. This was his senior officer. He was explaining this prophecy to his senior officer and others standing by. And he asked him, do I have everything correct? According to history now, he asked, as I say, I'm no expert in history. I'd be grateful to you if you would point out any errors. Oh, no, the astonished officer replied. No errors. Everything is accurate. Well, Franz, said Hauptmann, back to the book. You haven't finished. Uh, what do the feet represent? Franz, Franz explained the ten toes representing the ten tribes of modern Europe. He described the characteristics of iron and clay that make it impossible for these two substances to stick together. With that, he brought the Bible study to conclusion. The helpman was quiet for a moment. Well, he finally asked, what does it mean? Franz took a careful breath and prayed for courage. Herr Hauptmann, he said, the only conclusion a Bible student can come to is that the Führer cannot win this war. It will not be possible for him to unite Europe under his leadership and establish his thousand-year Third Reich. He looked earnestly into Hauptmann's face. Sir, the Bible predictions have been proven accurate again and again. And if they're accurate here, it means that we are fighting a losing battle. Dead silence. Hazel, yes, Herr Hauptmann, may I borrow your Bible for a few days? A week later, the Hauptmann returned the Bible. Hazel, he said, I appreciate what you shared with me. He looked around, lowered his voice. From now on, we will no longer operate a third of our motorized vehicles. The gasoline rations thus saved, I wanted to store drums and canisters so that when the end comes, we will have enough fuel to get back home. This prophecy gave hope to people in times of war. I want to ask you a question. Are we in times of war? Absolutely. We're going to get into more war sooner than later. The Bible is reliable. Absolutely. Listen to what the Bible says. They will not cleave one to another. Talking about the nations of Europe and the, gl and the global West. They will not cleave one to another. Now, June 25, 2016, we were headed on a plane to England to visit my in-laws. My children were still young there. And we were landing on the airport, and this was on at the airport. Washington Post and all the others. Brits vote to exit EU Royals Globe. Britain breaks with Europe. A Brexit earthquake. It was just all over. Everyone was in shock. Birth of a new Britain. I was renting a car. I was asking the lady there, and so what do you think? She was like, Man, this is the end of ends. I was like, wow. And then two years ago, what happened? They on left. National flags. We're going to wave you goodbye. And we'll look forward in the future to working with you as sovereign. And they, they muted a nice If you disobey the mic. rules, you get cut they off. They didn't like them leaving. Could we please remove the flags? flags? But believe me, this is prophecy. This is prophecy fulfilling before our very eyes. The EU being splitting up, a big member state leaving on the 31st of January 2020. And all over in the newspapers, this was the front covers. Bye-bye. Uh, after 47 years, uh, UK is out of Europe. C Copenhagen, Denmark, see you. Goodbye and good luck. All over Europe, they, they had this on the front pages because it was front page news because this was shocking to everyone. They couldn't believe eventually this went through. This meant, for Britain, yes, a new dawn, but for the EU, it meant that they were not so secure as they thought they were. Now, I have here a newspaper one that came out the following day after this Brexit took place. just want to share with you the words here. It says here, Tonight we are leaving the European Union. For many people, this is an astonishing moment of hope. A moment they thought would never come. I could have told them it would come. <laughs> because the Bible says they will not cleave. And here's the European Union today. Here's their building as I just showed it to you earlier. In the exact same pattern as 
ancient Babylon structure, what did they do? They built a tower to reach heaven to show God, we will be united in rebellion. Now, what did God say about that? So the Lord did what? Scatter them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build this city. God would not let this happen. Now, what about today? The prophecy says they will not cleave one to another. And this happened. Prophecies fulfilling in our very time today. Like Jesus said, today the scriptures fulfilled in your hearing. Today this is being fulfilled in our time. Britain is out of the EU. The prophecy is true. Guess what Napoleon said about this prophecy after his defeat at Waterloo? He wanted to unite Europe. He knew the prophecy. He even told people... <laughs> I will do it. And eventually when he lost, he said, God Almighty is to what? Too much for me. You see, friends, God gave us prophecy as a light in a dark, dark world. We have also a what word of prophecy? A more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. World War Three. will it happen? The odds are very good it will happen. Many wars are in front of us. But listen to Jesus' words. You shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass. But the end is what? Not yet. Even if it happens tomorrow, next year, if there's a global war, don't panic. It's not yet the end. Listen now. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. This should happen but what should happen first before it can be the end? I want to share with you this prophecy in Revelation 7. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Who's in control of this world? God. He's holding the winds, which means that He will not let it get out of control where we destroy one another. Because something has to be done before hell breaks loose. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seed of the living God. He cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till, can you see, till, until we have sealed the servants of our God in their very foreheads. And we will still deal with the seal. But until that time, God is holding the winds, and it's not yet the end of the end. Revelation 16 says the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. What will happen when God's servants are sealed? Armageddon will take place. Listen to the Bible. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. That will be the utter global war where it will be a war, not nation against nation. It will be a war against God and His people. Listen to this prophecy. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For He is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with Him are called and chosen and faithful. Amen. Amen. Who will win this war? Jesus Christ Himself. He's a warrior. His name is Yahweh. So this Bible prophecy does not stop at the feet. No, no, friends. It shows a rock that comes that none of these earthly rulers can stop. The Bible says, and in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out, out of the mountain without hands and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is what? certain, and the interpretation thereof, sure. Question, who determines the end? God or Satan? God. Who determines the end? The world empires or kingdoms or nations as we know today, or God? Don't stress. And yes, it's going to get more difficult. I showed it to you. It's going to get more difficult. But God is with us. And guess what? This rock coming is Jesus Christ. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, that rock was Christ. He's coming, and when He comes, you can know for sure that God is still in control. But because of this prophecy, I can know He's in control now. He's in control today. 
And here we have an enemy who thinks he controls everything. But though Satan has tried tyrannical empires to promote false religion and false gods to help establish his kingdom on earth, he cannot control God's what? God's love. Just want to, before I end tonight, I just want to show you this. This to me is just the most incredible part of this prophecy. The truth of God's love can and will reach the heart of the most deceived person if they are willing to look for truth. Amen? Yes, the result will be what? True worship over war. And so here we see in Daniel 2, the heathen king, God reaches him in his bedroom, in his mind, with a vision from heaven. God speaks to him. And when he hears the interpretation and sees, he's in awe. The Bible says he falls down before Daniel and wants to worship him. And he acknowledges Yahweh. We come to the next chapter in Daniel, and he rebels against the prophecy. He wants to change the prophecy. He sets up a golden image. Only Babylon will reign the world forever. And he forces everyone to worship. False worship. But who's in control? He throws the three Hebrew worthies into the fiery pit. And who's with him? Jesus Christ himself, the Son of God. And the king, the king swears allegiance to Yahweh. But eventually he turns his back again and he, and he goes into his Babylonian ways and one day he's on his roof and he's saying, I am the king of the world. I will last forever. This is my empire I've built for a thousand years and more. And then something happened. God makes him an animal. God humiliates him to try and reach his mind. For seven years he eats grass like a beast until he acknowledges Yahweh. And eventually what does he do? The king surrenders to Yahweh. And what happens? He becomes a follower of God and the true religion. And he shows the true religion to everyone in Babylon. I want to ask you a question. Is God mightier than Satan? Absolutely. If someone is somewhere just willing in their heart, just a little bit of willingness, God will triumph. Amen. So we have this prophecy coming to the world, symbolized by three angels. God is warning this world. And part of this last message is, and worship Him who made heaven and the earth, the sea, and the fountains thereof. Will you worship Him? Will it go along with a system of control? Or will the one, the control of love, who wants to control your life through love, what do you choose? Will you comply or will you stand for King Jesus? Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's end with a word of prayer. Father, what a wonderful privilege that we could study your word tonight. Yes, we are on the brink of great changes in this world. Wars, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. But Father, you are still in control because there's still a work to be done. And when everything is let loose, you are still in control, and you will protect your people. Oh, Father, I just pray that you will give us the certainty that you are in control of world events. Give us that peace, and may the morning star, the day star, Jesus Christ, rise in our hearts, and may we know him more and more so that we can be controlled by his love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.